Okay, we're going to talk about registration of the maxillomandibular relationship. We would say, and you're going to ask, why aren't you talking bite relationship? Bite is a dentocentric concept with the teeth fitting together. It's more complicated than that. We're talking about maxillomandibular relationship. How, in this case, does the mandible relate to the maxilla to create the optimal situation for breathing? So, okay, disclaimer, here's a story. You all know uh, the Moses is my invention, my appliance. What you may not know is we're going to use Moses bite shims, which is uh, invented by Glory as well. I just took all the credit with my name. But um, we invented these to take the bite. And so if you uh, use the Moses or bite shims, we get royalties, and that's the disclaimer. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. We're just disclaiming it. Okay, objectives of this part. So we're going to demonstrate that oral appliances for snoring and sleep apnea are just more than mandibular advancement devices. The common term, mandibular advancement devices, not applicable. It is applicable, but there's way more to it than that. Differentiate the concepts of facilitation from inhibition in neurologic function. You're right on that, Lee. You know what I'm talking about already. But the other constant thing is to demonstrate how to register a maxillomandibular relationship of low nociceptive input and a high degree of facilitation. That's what this is about. And that every team member should understand why this new method is different and better than contemporary bite registrations. Every member of the dental office team should be able to explain this new and better concept to a patient because it is different. It's different than what you're expecting. And so I want you also to understand the neurophysiology of the different methods of registering the bites. And I think we'll get to that. So what's the design principle? What, how, what are we basically trying to do uh, when we design an oral appliance? John, we talked about this already. And, and so the more space created in the mouth of the tongue, the less likely it is to collapse on the airway. And that's what we saw in Jan. Jan. It was likely to collapse because there wasn't enough room for it, for whatever reason. And so the principle is that it should dilate the oral airway. We want to make a bigger airway, and that's the point. Okay, mandibular advancement, fine. I mean, really, uh, the, um, the tongue is attached to the, you know, um, lower jaw in the front, and so if you move the jaw forward, you got to advance the tongue. And so mandibular advancement is a gimme. And, and stimulation of protrusive tongue reflexes. Up, oh, another part of the picture we're going to talk about. There are protrusive tongue reflexes. And so can we stimulate these to work better? Yes. And then the other one is we want the lips to remain comfortably closed with an oral appliance in place. Why? Because you should be nose breathing when you sleep. It's healthier. There's a book. If you go um, on the internet and you go Google Books, there's a book written by a guy, I don't know, Western artist, I forgot. It's not Remington. But anyway, it's, it's called Shut Your Mouth and Live. And uh, it's probably about 1878. And it's a really cool book. Um, and it's a guy, he was an artist, and he observed simply that um, people who mouth breathe at night are not as healthy. And he wrote a book about it. It's a good book. It's a classic. It's something you should have in your library. You could take the whole thing if you want it off of uh, Google Books. The other thing is it should remain, you should be comfortable. It should be comfortable to stay in your mouth. And then it should be strong and durable. It shouldn't break all the time. And then, because this is important. You know, you can't have these, these things expensive enough. You don't want the patient to own uh, two or three of these. And you don't want them breaking. Because when they break, if you have to send it to the lab to fix, it's, it's out of their mouth for too long a period of time. And the patient should be able to speak swallow and take a drink of water with the appliance in. This is a nice characteristic if you can achieve it, and I think we do. Okay, so let's look at mandibular advancement devices. Here's a mandibular advancement device. Here's a mandibular advancement device. Maybe this is this one. And then here's another one. So, okay, but this is an oral airway dilator. How is an oral airway dilator different from a mandibular advancement device? Okay, so here's the story. This actually is me. Whoa, excuse me. This is me. No appliance, lips together, 
teeth slightly apart, tongue in the roof of the mouth. So you have the back of the sinuses, maxillary sinus, back of the nose, and here's the airway. This is the oral pharynx here. And so here's the teeth you can see in the background. Where it's a, it's a, this is a picture we took with an iCAT, and it's using the software that comes with the iCAT called 3DVR. It's really, it's, 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 it's almost obsolete. They, they're, they're, not even, they're ashamed that it's in there, they're not bragging about it, but to me this picture's worth a thousand and then some words. So here's the second picture, and with the second picture here, the appliance is in place, the teeth are in the appliance, the lips are together, and the tongue is in the roof of the mouth. Look at the difference. That's oral airway dilation. That's what it's about. That's critical. I can't see that if you had a CPAP blowing pressure in, that you're going to expect any more from that CPAP than you get from this. And so that's what oral airway dilation is about. You get oral airway dilation with this appliance, the Moses appliance, and I don't see anybody else claiming oral airway dilation or showing you anything that visible or visual. That's what it is. Okay. So what's the role of the oral airway dilator in treating obstructive sleep apnea? Enlarge and change the shape of the oral pharyngeal airway. And when we do that, we change the head and neck posture relative to the spinal column. There's literature replete with studies. I know you know these, DeWitt. And that if you change the head posture, you change the bite, they stand up straighter. You put an orthotic in the mouth, if it's the right orthotic, they stand up straighter. And so uh, raise the habitual page position of the hyoid bone relative to the cranial base. Yes, because when you have these, a lot of times you'll see patients with this, this double chin, we could, my grandmother called it. And, and we have the double chin. What's the double chin? Yes, it's fat. How come you see this double chin on people who aren't fat? Because it's the tongue down there. The tongue doesn't belong down there. But the tongue has to go someplace, and this is nice soft tissue. And so this is the tongue. And so when you change the position of the hyoid bone, you bring it up, you get rid of that. And if you don't believe it, just look at the guy next to you who's got it, and you say, bring your jaw forward, and then boom, it disappears. So change the axis of muscular support of the tongue, we talked about that, and oral orthopedic dilation of pharyngeal musculature, that was the last picture you saw. Okay, so uh, here's another picture. This is anatomage. So today when you buy an iCAT, if you buy an iCAT, if you care to buy an iCAT, um, this is the kind of picture you can generate in half the time with the 3D VR. And so what this picture shows is total volume, which is irrelevant because it's very hard to get the same two points on the airway, top and bottom. But what's more important is it will figure it for you just because it's capable of doing it the minimum area. And so if you take a picture and you, like this here, and then you take a picture like you see on the right, you see that the difference between the airway on the left and the right is that we double the airway size and then some in this picture here. Okay, now, what's interesting about these two pictures is, is that really this is an open situation. And so here's a patient in my office. Why am I sharing this with you? Because the patient came in and they weren't doing so well. And I look and I go, wait a minute. Just a second, I think the laboratory gave me the wrong bite. And so I thought, well, let's take a new bite, and let's just take the new bite using manual muscle testing, which I'll show you. And when I did, you can see that in this picture here, we got more protrusion. But look at the effect. It's not always vertical, but look at the effect here from the little bit of protrusion. Look at what we did to the airway size. And so it's nice to have this information. Okay. Am I telling anybody, does anybody, I don't mean to imply that you have to run out and buy an ICAT. Now listen, it's good. It's good information. I love it. I'm glad I have it. But here's the story. When you get a referral from a physician, and that physician says, Dr. Keller, make this patient an oral airway dilator. Make this patient an oral appliance. What are you going to say? No, I'm sorry. I don't think this patient's right. You're going to make the appliance. The more information, you got to be careful. You don't want to talk yourself or the patient out of it. You want to make it. Because you can't make the diagnosis. They made the diagnosis, and the diagno part of their diagnosis is the treatment recommendation, and there's a reason why uh, they think you need it, and it, you don't want to talk the patient out of it. What you need is good records 
so that if it's a potential draw problem, they don't come back and say, yeah, you know when you made the Dr. Keller, my draws fell fine. You created a draw problem. That's why you need good records. And, and you know, Dr. Keller, you didn't really enlarge my airway. That's not the case. And so you'll see pictures where it looks like we really didn't enlarge the airway, and the patient will go, thank you for giving me my life back. So while the information is good, don't talk yourself out of an appliance if a physician sends you a referral. I think that's basic. That's my advice. When I first started doing this stuff, I was always looking to do it better. I'm still looking to do it better. But I read an article by Peter Sestouli, our friend in Australia, and he says that if you use a spirometer, you can get objective evidence as to whether an oral appliance will work. Well, I'm losing half my patients because they didn't pass the spirometer study, and all you got to give them is one negative reason not to do it, and they're out the door. And I'm going, what? And finally, I accumulate all my data, and I stop doing it. And then I go to lunch with Peter when he's in town for a meeting. I said, Peter, I'm really disappointed in these results. You weren't supposed to do that. That was a retrospective study. You have to wait till I do a prospective study to make sure this works. What? I thought the results were good. Well, we just searched the data to see what variable on that group of patients worked. And just because that variable looked like it was the most effective variable doesn't mean it's going to work in a prospective study. So I talked myself out of about 12, 15 cases before I learned the lesson. Don't talk them out of it. In my inner heart, I knew that I could do better than that study was telling me I could do. So it's a fine line. If you see something you, 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 screaming at you, like a tumor in the throat or something, and, and you're going to see stuff like um, large tonsils in adults. Can you, can you, you know, is that an indication or contraindication? And so there's a lot of reason, but try not to talk your patients out of oral appliances. When you get the referral, it says, make of one. Uh, you, at the point, we don't have all the answers. So we don't know a whole lot. I'm going to tell you what we do know. I'm going to tell you there's a whole lot we don't know. I can't tell you what we don't know yet. <laughs> so this is the lesson. Okay, common sense principles for registering a maxillomandibular relationship. Again, we want the maximum vertical that the lips can remain comfortably closed. We want a comfortable protrusive position. You can always increase the protrusive with a Moses. So don't torture them at first. Make it comfortable enough that they want to wear it. We were talking earlier today about the fact that the uh, airway, we said that uh, you see red battered uvula in a lot of these patients. You put an appliance in, so some of you are going to get, an, all of you, most of you are going to get appliances tonight. And then we're going to test you. We're going to put the appliance in, we're going to test you. But your uvula is going to be as bred tonight, tomorrow night, as it was tonight, right? Okay, so if you wait a week and that uvula heals because your mouth is shut and you don't have any snoring, then it stands to reason the results are going to get better, okay? But, but the fact of the matter is that you want um, the, 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 these things, there's things that are going to heal. And so you don't have to do everything maximum the first night. Combination of vertical and protrusive that maximally stents the airway open. How are we going to find that? We're going to ask the nervous system. We're going to say, brain, in what position are you most biofacilitated? Watch this. It's interesting stuff. We'll do a demo. Maybe we'll do it on Jan. She's such a good patient. Okay. So let's do a live demo. That's the next step. Okay. No. I'd like you to stay standing. Thank you. That's a very important. We're going to do the bite standing. Why am I going to do the bite standing? Most Can't important function of the back and neck in a human being, support the head in an upright posture. Right? So if you're sitting, you're slouching, you're slouching, you're sitting on your hands. Right Even you're slouching <laughs> with. You're slouching, you got a hand up there. Nobody's sitting up straight. Okay, that's the reason I take it standing up, because there's a better chance you're not, you're not even sitting. Okay, so standing up. Now, standing up, the best we're going to do is still head forward posture, but 
That's the best we're going to do. Okay, so now the question is, do your shoulders work? Are you comfortable or do you have shoulder pain? You're okay. Okay, so I want you to hold your hand up here like this, and I'm going to push down and you're going to... Re you have chewing gum in? Okay. So I'm going to push down and you're going to resist, but stand up straight as you can, and then I want lips together, teeth apart, tongue in the roof of the mouth. Okay, ready? Resist. Okay, now... She's pretty strong. Now what I'd like you to do is clench on your back teeth, okay? And resist again, ready? If that looked like that was mush, it felt like mush, right? Okay, now, take off one shoe, any shoe, good. Okay, now let's go back and do this. This is demonstration, it's very important with the patient. Okay, lips together, teeth apart, tongue in the roof of the mouth, what are you gonna expect? All right, boom. Now, shoe back on. What did we just demonstrate? Okay, nobody wants to tell me, so I'll tell you. We demonstrated biofacilitation. We demonstrated a position of low nociception. The brain, we ask in the brain, we're not asking the arm, we're asking the brain. What's the what position is the position of lowest neurological clutter? Lips together, teeth apart, tongue in the roof of the mouth. Okay, that was facilitation. The arm is up there. Now, let's introduce neurological clutter. That's inhibition. Wow. Okay? That's, that's inhibition, neurological inhibition. There's so much clutter. There's only so many circuits from here to here and they're cluttered. And so, it's like your computer. It goes slower when there's too much information. So, we've demonstrated facilitation, okay? And we've demonstrated biofacilitation and, and, neurologic, and, and neurologic inhibition, okay? So now, I'm gonna start, and these are the shims that you saw in the opening picture that we came up with. Originally, these were tongue blades that we sat and cut. And when we went to Patrick, and he said, well, Patrick came to us and said, I want to license this. I said, okay. He said, but get rid of the sticks. This is ridiculous. This is dark ages. This is caveman in technique. So we're out of the caves because we got these. Okay. Close. Okay. Lips together. Close your lips. There you go. Tongue in the roof of the mouth. Ready? Resist. Not bad. Okay. Let's do another. Let me. Now, so these, they lock, there's like Legos, they lock on one side, and one side's got an indentation, one side's positive. Okay, stand up straight. You all should have received shims in your stroke. Okay, so tongue in the roof of the mouth, lips together, stand up straight, resist. Okay, ready? Aha! How are you, are you feeling that that's, are you, you feeling you, a You felt more facilitated with three. Yeah. Yeah. Two was not as good. Now, we'll talk about this more in the slides. This is manual muscle testing. Now, manual muscle testing is a make or break. This is what the literature says. It's a make or a break test. And the break is, it goes down. If you do this six to eight times, they could get tired. And the point is, she knows and I know, right? There's no question and that I don't have to break. And the reason, it's, yes, it's subjective. You're going to find it extremely reproducible, and that makes it scientific. And these, they, they, it's been tested, and they test it. They use Zybex dynamometer, and we have one. I will show you. And so you take the, dy the dynamometer, and you put it here, or, and, you, and you push with it, and when the arm breaks, you stop and you look at the amount of pressure it took. And we have that. But then if you keep doing this, they get tired. You say, oh, it's just it's starting to ache. And you don't want that. So we want to test within the realm of comfort. You can test any muscle. I'm doing deltoid. I'm doing deltoid for a reason. I'm doing deltoid because you could do any indicator muscle that's healthy. So I could do biceps or I could do triceps. I could do just fingers. I say hold them together. You could do a middle finger there like that. And I could say hold. And she's stronger than I am. 
I'm, I'm getting old. I'm not as strong as some of you. And so you have to find a muscle. And so typically, if you'll read, the, I'll show you the picture, they'll do it like this. Well, I have people in my practice that are women that are so strong I can't do it. So I increase the lever arm. Now you could also do abduction, abduction. You could do pectoralis. You could do any muscle. And, and we had one guy in my office. And this guy was so strong, I couldn't budge anything. A major league baseball player, Hall of Famer, guy's got, can't tell you, but he's incredible number of home runs. And I had to go to legs and try and squeeze his legs together in the dental chair. That was the best I could do. But, but, but then, when we found the right bite, the guy could step out of the dental chair. He's, well, he's got the bite in his mouth. He's like, can you make me a mouth guard like that? The answer is, I thought you'd never ask. Damn right I can. All right, there's number four. Okay. We usually start with two shims just because if you, if you only have one, there's not enough clearance for the advancement screw. So we always start with two. If you can't get two in, and it is one, make it non-adjustable and you're out of luck. It'll cost you a lot less and you maybe you'll have to make two. But it's not, or use a different appliance. It's not going to be horizontally adjustable. There's another thing about horizontally adjustable. Here's what happens with horizontal adjustability. If you have the hook here and you're pulling it straight out, that's one thing. But if you have it here, you can do a little adjustment on one side or the other. It's very important. Okay, back to work. Ready? Lips together, teeth apart. T uh, teeth in there, tongue in the roof of the mouth. Ready? Resist. Oh, that's a toss-up, isn't it? Right? Three or four. What do you think? Well, let's try five. You think? You think what? I think when I when I do it. Okay. Which one were you? Do you feel like you are most facilitated just now? Three shims or four? Let's try it again. Four. You felt better with it. She felt better with four. Here's the next thing. Close. Look at the face. Does that look strange? Could she comfortably keep her lips together? Yes. Yes. Okay, give me another one. Let's just look. Okay. These are a millimeter and a half each. Let's just look. Okay. What do you think? Is that a strain? Okay. She says she's strained, she's strained. I would take that on a lot of patients though. I don't think that's terribly strained. And so we're going to do bites and we're going to look at each other. And I want you to look at the guy next to you. So, but the point is... Do you want to muscle test her on this one or not? Sure. Are you ready? Lips together, tongue in the roof of the mouth. Ready? Resist. Oh, <laughs> not there, right? Okay. Five. So I'm comfortable with four, but now we let's let's do it. Um, I want to show you do two different ways too. Okay. So. Do you need a little drying or no? Okay. So, he's just squirting a ribbon. I got the two sides and two, so it's smooth to smooth, two and two. Okay, close. Okay, so we let that set. And then she can go any which way, this way, this way, this way. And so when that's set, we're going to do this again. Set? No. Almost. You know, once in a while we luck out. So Henry Schein sent me the material to do for the um, Boston sleep meeting. So we went to Boston. We're using the Henry Schein material, except it was slow. You were there. Slow set. 
And I'm telling you, I'm just doing a song and a dance here, waiting for the dance stuff to set. There's not enough conversation you can make. All right, and I good. can't be that charming to talk for two and a half minutes. Okay. Let's go move what you think is a millimeter to the right of midline, mandible to the right, one millimeter. Okay. Ready? Resist. Oh, mile to the left. Ready? Resist. Okay, now find your midline. Find your midline and protrude as much as you comfortably can. Okay, ready? Okay. Hold it. Just hold it there. Don't move your jaws at all. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Watch this. I'm going to just put this, her, her case, in the molar area. I'm probably not even getting it back as far as I could. Okay. I didn't connect the two, but I'm also going to make, now close your lips, a little template in the front. Okay, so here's the plan. That's going to set in 60 seconds, we'll say. When that sets, I want you to just open enough that I can ease out this front part. Okay, so I'm going to ease out the front part. Then we're going to test. Now listen, right now, or when we did this, she was biting down with the shims in the front, okay? Now with the shims in the front, the masseter can contract farther than temporalis. Temporalis can't contract any more than the thickness of those shims, right? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to test, is she masseter dominant or is she temporalis dominant? Maybe she's better off with a temporalis dominant bite. Maybe she's better off with a masseter dominant bite. So now, what I'm going to do is separate your lips. Open just enough for me to ease this out. Good. Open just enough to ease it out. That's all right. It, it, I didn't get, do such a good job of easing it out, but there it is. Now bite down. Got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Nothing in your hand. Ready? Lips together, tongue on the roof of the mouth. Matter of fact, tongue to your lips. Okay, ready? Resist. No, you gotta, you're going to resist. Okay, ready? Resist. Better. The best, right? Okay. Because, she, again, let's look at her. Those are some, some masseters. Look at you. Stand up. Joe, John, stand up. Stand face the audience. Not you, John. This John. You John can stand Norris. up. You can stand up too. But I want John Norris. Okay. See that? Mm -hmm. That's most likely going to be a, a temporalis profile. And look at this. Okay. That's her. Okay. So now, what I'm going to do is you just stay there, and I'm going to connect these two. And. Overlap everything. Close your lips. Good job. Okay. That's the bite. If it wasn't perfect, then I would have put the other one, if it wasn't as good, I would have put the other one back in and connected the two bites. Any questions? Do you understand? All right, I'll show it again if you want. This is a one-piece bite. It's coming out. It's going to be old, no shims. Okay. You got the shim still, Glor? Okay. Open. Okay. And before you send these to the lab, cut off all gum. Cut off all soft tissue. Only send the lab hard tissue. Because the soft tissue, it's like, it's like a soft sponge. It's going to move. And if you try and put this on hard plaster, you, you run the risk of a distortion. It won't go down as easy. Don't let this to the lab to do. Because if you, if, you, if you send something like this to the lab, you'll get it back and it won't be cut. If they cut them, that's fine. But, but you don't take a chance. Trim off all soft tissue. Okay, back to the two. What is that so this, this is, is discus dental vanilla bite registration. Any one's good that you we, like. Yeah, whatever. Fastest, the faster the better. We find this is 55 seconds. That's why I like it. 
And he likes it because it trims without crumbling too. And it bonds when you, when you overlap. Okay, so let's do this. We're back to this first one again. Now, I showed you both bite techniques. That's good. Just let it set. 90% of the time, I'm going to use this one here, not the other one. Because there's two things. When you get this where it's a lock, Bam! You could chin yourself on that arm. I call it the lock. When you got a lock, don't mess with the lock. It's right. If you don't feel you got a lock and you're looking, piddle, play around. Go for a lock. I felt closer to the lock with the masseter, with actually, actually with the temporalis dominant bite in your case. Because the masseters couldn't contract, right? The rubber base, the, the bite registration material stopped the masseters contracting, the temporalises did contract. She said. Okay. So now, find the position of, just because we know you can do it, maximum protrusive in the midline. Maximum comfortable protrusive. Okay, let's test it. Okay. Ready? Resist. It's not quite the same as it was on the other bite. Okay, but let's just do it. Here. Okay. Here. And so what I do is, these, these shims have re retentive grooves, and I overlap onto the shims. I try and grab the retentive grooves, and I go as far back as I can, overlap everything, get the grooves, and then close your lips, and that's it. That's the bite. Yes, Richard? Interesting you ask that question, because we're going to talk, hopefully, about the mouthpieces, about performance mouthpieces. So let me give you an analogy. If you take methyl methacrylate, that has a durometer of roughly 100. It's hard. It's rock hard. If you took this, it's a, a, a 80. It's a durometer of 80. If you take Splash, which I use, it's a medium-bodied rubber base, that's a durometer of about 60. And if you take light body rubber base, uh, polyvinyl, that's 40. Okay? So the, this is 80 is a good durometer for this kind of a technique. So it's, it's, it's got a little give, but it's harder than the gingiva. So when it's liquid, it's, the gingiva is going to comply and contort. And when you cut it off, you only have hard tissue. Okay, any question? Okay, let's go on, and I'll, I'll try and get this. So, so maybe if she's really, you know, indulgent, then you can go over and test her in both bites. Oh, sure. Let's put this. Well, thank you. Let's put um, the other. Bite. But it's, you'll see what. Let's yes. Put the other bite in your case too, then. Wait, wait, wait! I don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Get her a microphone, please. Shims. I can't hear. Ah. The one with the shims wasn't quite good. Hello. Yes. The bite that you did the first time was a masseter bite? Yes. Is that what no. you're saying? The, the temporalis can't close any more than the, it is on the shims. But there's nothing back here. So the masseters can dominate. The masseters can still close more. They're, still, they're compressing, but this can't. So when we squirt the stuff in in the back, we get a little bit different position. And I'll show you that's coming up. So that was a masseter dominated the, the bite. The first bite with the shims in is a masseter dominant bite. All right. The second one is a, with, uh, that we showed on her was a temporalis dominant. When because with the, with the vanilla registration in the back, the temporalis, the masseters are stopped, but the temporalis. Can when you took the shims out? Yes. OK. Yes. And which one did you like the best on her? The one where she, nothing in the front, the, the um, masseter dominant. Okay. Let's, let's go. Okay. Okay. Let's, in human beings, the most important function of the back and neck is support the head in an upright posture. Therefore, as we said, we're doing this upright. We're doing this standing up for that reason. Okay. 
In an upright human posture, isometric balance is the least stressful position for supporting the head on the spinal column. If you have teeth apart, tongue in the roof of the mouth so your nose breathing, that's as close as we're going to get to biofacilitation. Isometric balance is a position of low nociceptive input to the brain. There's no clutter. Nociception is clutter. Okay. So basically this is the principle. You look in the chiropractic books. This is the emblem, I think, of the chiropractic society. And so when you have imbalance, you have in inhibition, when you have balance, you have facilitation. Okay, tongue in the roof of the mouth gets you the largest airway. Lips together necessitates nose breathing. Teeth apart in rest position, low nociceptive interference. Stand up as straight as you can. We're getting as close to isometric balance as we can. Again, low nociceptive input is, conditional, is facilitation, conditional facilitation. Conditional cause. Maybe it'll be better tomorrow. Maybe her neck is tight today. Maybe she has a hip problem today. Maybe it could get better. And maybe that's the basis for some of these adjustments. Okay. So, the axioms again. Low nose susceptive input facilitates neurologic transmission and ideal nervous system function, or optimal. Uh, high nose susceptive input clutters neurologic transmission and inhibits reflex activity. No susception, I looked it up in the dictionary. Noxious stimulation, noxious, harmful, corrupting, noisome. Noisome, offensive, harmful, deleterious, you can read this. Pernicious, harmful or destructive, and deleterious, harmful, destructive or injurious. So, no susceptive input is defined as providing neurologic clutter. Today's demonstration. How to register a maxillomandibular relationship of low nociceptive input is one of low neurological clutter and high facilitation. This demonstration did not measure strength or weakness. This demonstration in no way relates to muscle strength. The fact of the matter is that we're testing the same muscle. The same muscle, when it does this and goes down, it didn't get weaker. It's the same muscle, same ADP, same ATP. Different neurological transmission, different neurological input, different nociception. It's the same muscle. We're not testing strength, we're testing how well it functions. Nociception. Okay. Now, we were talking about this, Lee and I, before, I believe. And when you go to the literature, because again, we took this to the next level, we say, can we make a better mouthpiece for athletic performance? The answer seems to be yes, uh, not just from me, but the literature is very replete. So I, I mean, you got a big, probably a bigger bibliography than I do. In your book, I think Glory gave you my bibliography on that. There could be 36, if I'm not mistaken, references to the fact that jaw position affects muscle um, performance, and they actually, in a lot of these, do claim strength, and there's a difference. So that strength, for example, weight trainers, when they do this for strength, they uh, make a mouthpiece in optimal facilitation and then do their exercise in that and then they get stronger. It's not that the mouthpiece makes them stronger, it's the training makes them stronger. Thank you. Okay? The difference. The mouthpiece doesn't, the mouthpiece facilitates neurologic performance. So I think you've got to be careful when you make claims or these people make claims we make the athlete stronger. I don't think so. Let's discuss the validity of manual muscle testing. What does it measure? Is it reliable? And does it merit scientific validity? And so the regulation of muscle function is basically accomplished at a subconscious level. The information is provided within the muscle spindle cells, the Golgi tendon, and gener generate signal outputs. The function and movement are generated by the premotor and motor cortex and sent into the reticular activating system, the hypothalamus, and the limbic brain. So, I can't look at Jan and go, okay, limbic brain and hypothalamus answer me. But we are asking this question of a lower brain activity. It's not a cerebral question. Can you make yourself stronger? We're asking it at a lower brain level. It's a reflex question we're asking. We're asking for a reflex answer. 
It's not voluntary. Okay, so no lecture on reflex will be complete without the roadmap. And so you see your roadmap, and that's your sensory roadmap, and of course, there's a motor roadmap if there's a sensory. And so you see what happens here. The one is asking the mandible, airway, and teeth, and the other one is getting the motor input, is telling us what's happening. And so if you look, if you remember back in dental school, at least when I was in dental school a mighty long time ago, in Gray's Anatomy you always had this picture and there was some anatomy professor that would try and explain this. I never knew what he was talking about, but now it starts to make sense because you have a tremendous amount of innervation here and this is what's dictating a good deal of the fun neurologic function. And then the other question really is, is what, what are we all relating to here? And a lot of this stuff is trigeminal nerve. We got an incredible nerve that we work with every day. Okay, day, daytime neural control is of airway size is largely under involuntary control. Head posture is affected by airway patency. If you have a mouth breather, they're always going to be head forward. Mouth is open, head forward. Mouth breathers have a more forward head posture than nose breathers. Forward head posture is more stressful on the spinal column than good head posture. The oral airway is smaller in a mouth breather than in a nose breather. And apneic patients have smaller airways during the day than non-apneic patients. And that's the key with this athletic performance. Yeah, we're going to make the airway larger at night. But then what happens? They take it out during the day. Can we help these patients during the day? Yes. Can you, can you perform your aerobic functions better if you can breathe better? That answer ought to be obvious. It is obvious. Okay. Manual muscle testing. That's what we demonstrated. And again, you can use any muscle, any indicator muscle, as long as you can find a point. We'll call it the break point, for lack of a better term. Manual muscle testing is utilized to determine an effective therapeutic starting position for oral sleep appliances. We're asking the brain to help us at a reflex level. Manual muscle testing, as described and demonstrated, is identical to standards of muscle testing utilized in physical medicine or disability. So they have this uh, physiatrist, our specialist in physical medicine, and when you have a physiatrist, they can do a disability examination on any muscle and that's what they use. This is not mystical. This is not unique to chiropractic or dentistry. It's, 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 it's com mainstream physiatric medicine and it's mainstream, um, it's mainstream physical therapy. Physical therapists know this as well.